In 2009, the member states of the United Nations adopted a strategy to eliminate or significantly reduce drug trafficking in 10 years. Today I'm standing here at the UN headquarters in Vienna. Inside the building, governments are discussing the midterm review of the implementation of this strategy. Outside the building, NGOs are uh, protesting against the international drug control system. Remember coffee users, coffee is illegal in this country by law of King Frederick. 200 years ago, coffee was prohibited because it was a substance that they thought could wake up this, the rebellious spirit of people. Now it is laughable to think about coffee prohibition, but in a few years it will be laughable to think about cannabis prohibition or coca leaf prohibition or opium prohibition. I check my email and I decide to answer later. Another cup of coffee and I drag myself to work. My life is grounded in a firm routine of coffee, sleep, and work. I am not boring, I just stick to what I know. What's fascinating about this meeting is what's not really being said. A few people are talking about the Uruguay and the cannabis legalization in the U.S., but the U.S. isn't talking about it. In the interministerial statement, they could not even agree. Mexico wanted to get some language in the statement that acknowledged that there's a debate going on out in the world about drug policy, but they couldn't even get satisfactory language into that. Can you explain us the current state of the Washington regulation? Just last week, uh, middle of March, the uh, agency began issuing licenses to the first people who will be allowed to legally grow cannabis in Washington state. So we will expect to have stores open this summer by June. Do you think that the state laws in Washington are in line with the international drug conventions? I think it would be very difficult to make the case that allowing licensing and regulation of the commercial production and distribution of cannabis um, for non-medical purposes is consistent with the international policies. On the other hand, there is an argument to be made that our federal government um, has to give some leeway to the individual states because we are a federation, our nation is. And so there are some constitutional considerations at play in the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, there remain challenges in the implementation of the conventions that should be recognized and discussed. But dismantling the provisions of the convention would not help to achieve the ultimate goal of international drug control cooperation, protecting the health and welfare of people. Certain states, parfois les mêmes, discutent de la légalisation de la production, de la culture et de la distribution de marijuana à des fins purement ludiques, parce que ce serait dans l'air du temps. Où est la logique politique Quel message est donné à la jeunesse à nos enfants en matière de prévention. Qui assumera la responsabilité politique si en rendant les drogues accessibles sans contrôle médical, nous créons une génération incapable de se concentrer sur des tâches élémentaires The head of the INC with the International Narcotics Control Board criticized your country for its uh, cannabis policies and he said that uh, uh, it's not in line with the conventions and uh, uh, it's a danger for public health. So what did you respond to Mr. Jans? We think that the, the interpretation of the convention is not a strictly uh, 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 interpretation and there are different interpretations. For example, People, there are people here in this in this organization, some countries, they have an interpretation that the death penalty is allowed by the convention. We don't believe that. We don't agree with this interpretation, but it's a discussion. So we, we support another kind of vision, but it's possible. So that shows that it's possible to have different interpretation of the convention. As Mr. Fedotov said, we need to remember what is the original spirit. And the original spirit is a health problem. It's not a security problem. And we think, that when you have a strictly regulated market, you have better control and better concentration because it's more difficult to control an invisible market than a visible market. What is the role of the INCB now uh, in, in this new context? I think it has clearly overstepped its bounds in its criticisms of Uruguay, and, and I, I'm particularly talking here about the director, uh, Mr. Jans, and there is a, a very serious need to uh, rethink 
what the INCB should be doing, how it should be working with member states, and to remember that it really is a tool of the member states. It is not there to chastise member states when it does when those states do something it doesn't like. The other issue is transparency. It is the only UN agency that I know of that has absolutely no transparency. We don't know what happens in those meetings, and even members are not allowed to talk about what happens in those meetings, and that has to change. I go upstairs and get myself another cup of coffee. I get downstairs and then I spill it on the floor. Well, my life is grounded in a firm routine of coffee, sleep, and work. I am not boring, I just stick to what I know. Criminalization of drug use, restrictive drug policies, and incarceration are further key drivers of HIV and hepatitis C epidemics among people who inject drugs. We are a group of more than 40 youth from more than 30 countries, and this is our message to you. Punishing people that use drugs is costly and counterproductive. People suffering from drug dependence need easy access to treatment and health services and not criminal sanction and isolation. The human rights violations that we are seeing conducted in the name of drug, of drug control are not accidents, they're not uh, aberrations, they are systemic. They are something that inevitably flows from securitizing an issue such as drug control. We're seeing an increasing I think false consensus around the need for a health-based approach and I think there are some real challenges here and one of the challenges is the move to see people who use drugs as suffering from some kind of pathology and I think we need to be extremely mindful of this fact and recognize that many of the people who are now buying into a health-based focus are not in fact our friends. The medicalizing project is another form of social control that we need to be very vigilant of. We need to watch that we don't see a new system of control put in place and instead of criminalizing people, turns us into just being patients subject to the control of medical authorities. You said that uh, drug control activities should comply with uh, human rights, but actually UNODC is funding activities in countries where there, is, there are mass violations of human rights, like Iran, for example. So how can you make sure that this money is not spent on activities that are violating human rights? We have a risk assessment system that allows us to, to check uh, every penny we spent that this uh, uh, is not uh, supporting any human rights violations, including in Iran. The subtext to, of this meeting is what's going to happen in 2016 at the UN General Assembly Special Session on Drugs, because the tone of this meeting and the tensions that have arisen in this meeting uh, things are pointing towards what's happening in the future. There is a, a group of countries that really wants to make sure that what happens in 2016 is, the, is, is an open, transparent debate and the beginning of an effort to rethink the International Drug Control Conventions. The consensus is breaking down. How do you see the future? Is, is there a chance to find a new consensus or this meeting will just lose relevance? We have to find a new consensus that actually impacts on drug markets and drug use. Um, we have two years uh, up until the General Assembly and I'm not sure I'm optimistic because I'm looking at the political dynamics and I, I'm not sure how this gap can be bridged but we have to try because if the UN does not find a new way of dealing with drug markets they will become irrelevant. What happens on the ground is what will push the policy and the UN will be irrelevant and I don't think that's good. I'm a multilateralist. I think there should be agreements from the top but if they continue to address the issues in the current way we, uh, uh, we will become irrelevant relevant at uh, an international level. Does it make any sense for us to come here, NGOs, to come to, come to, the, to Vienna every year? Maybe it's better to focus on local changes and just ignore the conventions. Well, I think, I think it makes sense to come. I think we need to be aware that change doesn't start here, that this is a, this is a body that, will, that may follow uh, the change. There's nothing they can do or, or seem to be able to do about Uruguay uh, legalizing cannabis uh, and the same in the U.S. So NGOs really need to work at the country level uh, to encourage their governments uh, to say, well, look, it's possible to do things that are technically outside the treaty. The sky's not going to fall. A world war isn't going to begin. Sanctions won't, won't happen. Uh, 
So let's uh, let's begin to experiment with with different approaches. Rock by baby on the treetop. Lunch hours over and I can't stay up. I've got to drink coffee, but that's a mistake. I best switch to decaf or I'll stay awake. My life is drowned in a fermentine of coffee, sleep, and work. I am not boring, I just stick to what I know.